Praise the Lord. The Bible study, study, the topic is walking Jesus. Walking Jesus. As per walking around. Mobile Jesus. The one that is moving around. The one that everybody sees moving up and down. Jesus still walks the earth today. But that is something that we have to understand. How does he walk the earth? as human beings, as we. I said on Sunday that one of the most fundamental statements of the scripture is found in John 14, verse 20. Can we have John 14, verse 20? John 14, verse 20. At that day, you will know that I are my father, and you are in me, and I in you. The side that concerns us today is, you are in me, and I in you. That is the walking Jesus. That is, if you were whom he expects you to be, as you walk past, that should be Jesus passing. Because he's in you and you are in him. There's no separation between the two. And I did say that at that point, he was ordinarily speaking to his disciples. So everybody would say, okay. Actually, he said he was praying for his disciples. But let's go to chapter 17 of the same John. I read it on Sunday anyway. But we read it so that we have the explanations correctly. John 17, from verse 20 to verse 23. I do not pray for this alone, but also for those who believe in me through thy word. Through whose word? The word of the apostles. And that's what we have today. The New Testament that we have is the word that they gave to us. If we believe through thy words that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are. Verse 23, that's the one that concerns us. I in them and you in me, I in them. And I said on Sunday, we should get to that point. Or actually, God expects us to be, if you are walking past, that's Jesus walking past. Now, but does that happen because somebody lays hands on you? <laughs> or because you prayed more than another person? It won't happen. Or you fasted more than anybody else? No need. There's something I used to say. If you are looking, talking about people who fast more than anybody else, they are called mystics. They are not Christians. <laughs> but does the fasting gain them anything? Nothing. It gains them powers of spiritual darkness. <laughs> or power of darkness in the spiritual realm. So that when you are talking about The walking Jesus. You are talking about the person who has become, he's in Jesus and Jesus is in him. Now, like I said, since it does not require prayer or laying of hands or fasting or anything, then how, does I, how do I get there? How do I get there? There has to be a way. There is something that God has done consistently, always. Without fail, God has never left us in dark as to what he is doing. Even the things that the people of old called mysteries in our days, God has, already, has opened them up completely. So that there is no question of, oh, that one is a mysterious thing, I can't understand it. I used to say, once you hear somebody say that, well, except you want the blind to lead the blind, otherwise take off. <laughs> 
Because what he's telling you is that he does not know. And he's supposed to be your leader. Where are you people going to? You are following the bit straight. Praise the Lord. So we are going to look at a few aspects of it, of how to arrive there. Number one, John 6, verse 56. John 6, verse 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. I said we are going to look at a few things, not plenty. But now this elevates communion to a different thing completely. <laughs> it shifts communion from what we have known to a different thing completely. That is to say, if I live the life he expects of me, at the time, each time I participate in communion, there is a transfer of personality between him, me, and Jesus. So that I can't just approach communion the normal way. Okay, we are going to take communion just to maybe have some spiritual power for something to happen. No. There's a rearrangement of existence. I am no longer that person that you thought I am. Something has transferred. This is Jesus. I have taken in Jesus and I'm giving him part of me. That also means that before I take communion, that business of let a man examine himself. So much of what people take the bread and the wine is bread and wine. And that is very good if it is bread and wine. Because it's just like the same thing, like you went into the supermarket, bought bread, and bought Coke, and ate, and drank. Simple thing, you go. Now it gets into a problem. If the thing is properly dedicated, and it's actually the bread, the body, and the blood of Jesus, and you do it wrongly, what does it do? What does the Bible say? It brings death. Me, I've seen somebody die before in our church in the village. <laughs> At communion. You see the kind of nonsense that goes on today in the name of Christianity? The thing didn't exist before. <laughs> they used to have real Christianity. Mm. If I... Actually, what I am doing is true communion. There is an exchange of personality or a coming together of personalities. So next time, if you have the opportunity to attain a communion, check yourself first before you even reach the place. Otherwise, don't go. Don't make the attempt. Communion is not so that you get healed or so that you get some money in your pocket or something happens. <laughs> it's far more fundamental than that. All of that thing, you want to go and uh, go for interview, take communion, so you go for interview, so that you will pass or you will be promoted, some stuff. <sighs> That's not the one of Jesus. That's the one what men have toyed around with the things of God for. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I am in you. Praise the Lord. Number two. John, the same, John 15, verse 5 and verse 6. John 15, 5 and 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and threw them into the fire and they are burned. Now get back to verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Yeah, there is no branch of a mango tree that will say, I am palm front. <laughs> but that is what we try to do. If you were in him, then you should be like him. And he says something here. He said, listen, things don't happen the way you want them to happen. That is simply because you don't abide. Because without me, there is nothing you can do. For without me, you can do nothing. So why am I almost consistently not able to do anything? That should tell me that there is a disconnection. That Jesus is not in me, and I am not in him. I said that statement is very fundamental, but it's to the extent that it should make you sit down and look at yourself again. Who am I? What kind of life am I living? We live this Christianity that says, okay, if you do right, you go to heaven. So you are doing something so that you go to heaven. This one is way out of that level. That business is nothing. Because we are now talking about me walking around and that's Jesus moving. That's not somebody who obeys God so that he will go to heaven. The uh, obedience of that uh, rich young man. I have done all these things since I was a youth. Jesus looks at him and says, well, <laughs> try this one. He said, no, that one won't work. But that's the thing that is happening with us. The mechanical side will keep. The transformation, everything gets blocked at that point. Being able to abide in him. I, when it says you abide in me, it means that Okay, God told uh, Joshua, this word shall be the frontlets on your eyes. That's the glasses. You can't see anything without the glasses. And whatever you are seeing, you will see through the glasses. If I am abiding in Jesus, everything of mine is done through Jesus. I work in the bank. I teach in a school. I work as a laborer in a farm. I'm a tailor. I'm a, a cook. I am a preacher. Whatever I am, it has to be through Jesus. And that is why it says, whoever you serve, even you are a slave, serving a hard master, you work with him as unto who? Unto God. Because you are, you are the thing is, you are abiding in Jesus. The transaction is not with this fellow, whatever he does. My transaction is in the Jesus ship because I am in him. If anybody sees me, even as a slave, he should be seeing Jesus. So that my slave master, when he looks at me, what he sees is Jesus. Now, this thing will change, we have to, it will affect us somehow. Because if we are talking about a walking Jesus, and this is Jesus walking, and I want to pass here, grace puts us, I fall and break my teeth, and I wake up, what Jesus will, will anybody see? The one that is fighting her. How, what kind of nonsense? How did this one start? What did I do to you? Is that Jesus walking? Is that the one that abides in him? <laughs> the next time I want to say a thing to somebody, I should ask myself, is this Jesus talking? You know those things that I say, we used to say, a child does something or somebody does something, God will forgive you. Is that Jesus talking? I see that could not be end. That is Jesus. <laughs> That's why I said the thing has nothing to do with. I pray it. I will become lie lie. You will become nothing. You have to sit down with yourself and examine yourself. How is this thing going to work? Is it realistic? If it were not, the God would not recommend it. God won't say. You know, it's easy that, that thing that Paul said. 
I am crucified with Christ. All of us will shout, I'm crucified with Christ. See, I am spiritual power. Now nah, lie. <laughs> because if she put the stud, I fall. Break my teeth, even break one eye. When I wake up from there, what should I do? Bless them that cross you. How many of us will do it? Right at that point, will you bless the one that has cursed you? You will see the one and know that this one is a disaster. As a matter of fact, if anything, you will curse the person to go to hell. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. Did he curse him? Has anybody seen the book of Matthew when Judas comes with the crowd and approaches Jesus? And what did he say? Friend. <laughs> we are talking about Jesus walking. So it's not, ah, okay, I in Christ. Leave the matter down. Show the Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are still here. Uh, Matthew 11, verse 29. Okay, sorry. John 14, verse 21. Let's get that one. John 14, 21 is still part of number two. We have not finished with number two. I jumped. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. That's the one that abides in him. How many commandments do we keep anyway? I am talking about us here as church. I am not talking about today's theology that says there are no commandments. <laughs> and you know the thing that I used to question about that thing? The scripture says the laws of, my, of God are written where? Where? So it was the, the one inside the heart, were they removed? <laughs> So somebody will come and say there are no laws. The fellow lost his brain. Who has my commandments and keeps them? It is the one that he will be able to come and live inside, manifest himself to. There was a time people were praying all manner of prayer to get to see Jesus manifest. And all manner of demons we manifested to people and they will come out and tell you that Jesus. <laughs> they saw Jesus. There is nobody who ever sees Jesus and remains the same. So the fellow finished seeing Jesus and he still lives a casual life in which, which, which Jesus is that one? The Jesus of the devil. <laughs> Praise the Lord. As we are going, if you have a question, you let us know. Number three, John 15, verse 7. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in, in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. This is something that should help me know if I abide in him. This one is straightforward. I am absolutely sure, in fact, ten times sure, that there is nobody here who does not have the things you have desired for years and it didn't come to pass. And you are still desiring, nothing is happening. So does that show proof that you abide in him? Because it says, if you abide in me, this is what will happen. I have said that the Christianity without proof is useless theory. And well, that is what has been going on. And it ends in massive frustrations. I have to sit down with myself and reason with myself. It's Bible study, but actually, it should be an opportunity for each one of us to look at ourselves. It's not time to complain, Lord, do this one, Lord, do this one. Now, but let me say this before we continue. The things that you have asked God to do, the things you are yearning for, 
all of the problems of your life, if you were Jesus walking, would those things happen to you? Which of those things would happen to Jesus? So what does that prove? Does it prove that Jesus is in you? So I passed here and a snake decided to bite me and even poisoned me. Would the snake bite Jesus? I'll turn around and blame the snake. Or blame whoever opened the hole so that the, if he didn't open that hole, the snake would not have reached here. Even if there were a million snakes and Jesus came, would any one of them shake? So which means the snake is able to bite me because there's no Jesus, it's me. The other thing is pretense. I'm just pretending that I'm, Jesus is in me. Praise the Lord. Yeah, so if you are able to abide in me, whatever you ask happens. What you desire is different from what you need. We have the level of what you need. Very important need, extreme need. Even the needs of our lives, we are not able to get from God. You move from there to the area of want. Even the things that may not be really necessary. Those ones, we are... In fact, you know what the fellow who is asking you to pray will tell you? Ask for your needs. Leave the wants. <laughs> but you know, the scripture, the Lord is my shepherd. Even my wants are taken care of. But here we are struggling with even the needs. Then this is a, an outrageous statement. Whatever you desire. Not that you want it wrong. Just that you desire it, that's all. Whatever it is that you desire. Every man has to be his own teacher. Every man has to be his own judge. Every man has to be his own examiner. This is not a question of somebody saying, yeah, 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 you are judging me. Hallelujah. I'm not going with you, you are judging me. Who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> If you are able to abide in me and my words abide in you. It's one thing to know the word of God. It's a different thing for the word of God to abide in you. Who is the person that the word of God abides in? The hearer and doer. I said something the other time. I don't know if I said it here or somewhere that I went to preach or maybe on radio. You know what we have in church? Note the guys. And it's good that I've remembered. Note the guys. The notes that you took in 2005, where are they today? Do you even go back to look at them? No, we have note the guys. That's for sure. That is, I don't even know if it is definition of Christianity, you must take notes. There's nothing wrong with taking notes, but are we note takers or doers of the word of God? See, somebody will sit in church and write and write and write and write 20 pages before the message is over. How many of it does that fellow refer to? Or how much of it? When it's done? When it's over, does the person refer to any one of them? The, one, the notes you took in January, at what time have you gone back there since this year? Does this year, January this year? Have you opened back to the one of January? The one of last year, ah, no. Ten years ago, ah, no. But you see that your notes, where you pile them, then a little child go and touch the note. Oh. <laughs> That is when you know that the Jesus did not, ex did not have exist at all. My church notes. Oh. Did you refer, did you ever look at it? Church notes. I think I said it in a radio program recently. We just have note takers. 
That's all. Study the note, Usai. So how will you grow? My words abide in you. When you finish taking the notes, okay, the note that you took, first Sunday of September. Can you remember what was there? It went. You closed that side, and it is permanently closed. You are not going back to that side again. So what was the use? And my words abide in you. Praise the Lord. Now, don't make a mistake of thinking that I have anything against note-taking. For me, it's not me who said it. It's Shakespeare who said it. The shortest pencil is better than the longest brain. Because what he meant by that is that whatever that short pencil writes, you can still go back and see it. But whatever your brain said it carried, uh, by the time you, by tomorrow, this Bible study, by tomorrow you remember one tenth of it. If you are, in fact, there are people who won't remember one, one feet today. Not to talk about tomorrow, not to talk about this time next week. It's gone, completely disappeared. So the notes is important. If only you go back and look at it. Without the notes, you are absolutely useless. Because there's no reference point. There is nothing to remember. There is no human brain that is a library. Not one. There's no such brain. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We are talking about how we can become the walking Jesus. There has to be a continuous interaction with the word of God, continuous. That is where that note becomes important. I wrote it, I went back, I looked at it, I studied it. If you pick up your note of what, you know, I used to write some little notes of things that I want to do, scripture-wise. But if I look back at the things that I wrote years ago, some of them even shocked me. But do we go back to look at it? No, all you know is that that is your pile of Bible notes. Long pile from ground to this point. Nothing, you don't open even one. Hmm. Praise the Lord. Matthew 11, verse 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What is the yoke? We are now talking about studying the word of God. That's some yoke you have to carry. There is no option to it. Absolutely no option. It's, you know the thing they call a Pentecostal movement or charismatic movement. You know what it's all about? Noise. <laughs> You make some noise, fall and wake up. You fell under anointing. There is no falling under anointing that will remotely lead anybody on the path of heaven. It will never happen. If you like fall under anointing every second, you are not going to heaven. My words abide in you. That is why I used to say, I said, I can't define that we are a Pentecostal church. I have no business with that definition. I am not interested in it. <laughs> Neither am I interested in the nomenclature or whatever, stigma. Uh, Orthodox church, this one. No. Who is interested in that thing? For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Hold on. How many of us have found rest for our souls? I was talking of a situation that you walk into somewhere, something happens and it doesn't... Like you open the door, there is a lion and you are walking past. Because there is a Jesus walking in you. There's a restfulness that has come into your life because of the presence of Jesus. 
not because of your volume of prayers. We still think that things happen by volume of prayers. That's an unfortunate thing. Things don't happen by volume of prayers. There is nothing that will obey you because you prayed all night. Proof, how many times have you not finished praying all night? Immediately you let down, they pressed you. <laughs> what should that convince anybody? Be praying all night is not a solution to anything. <laughs> if you are looking for the solution, the Jesus has to be there. There's nothing wrong with praying all night. Nothing wrong at all. As a matter of fact, if you can do it, I'll encourage you to do it. But you see the problem? The prayers without Jesus is useless. All of the charismatics without Jesus is nonsense. When the disciples came back, all the demons obey us. Who was inside there? Judas. And he was heading to hell. As a matter of fact, at that point, he had already got his reserve seat in hell. <laughs> so you heal the sick. So what? You heal the sick, that's all. And the thing that I used to say, maybe you went there to make too much noise, and God does not want to listen to that noise. He will tell the fellow to stand up so that you can close your mouth and walk away. And you come out from there, I heal that man. You didn't heal anything. If you heal that man, after that, the back pain that is hooking your back, heal the back pain now. <laughs> you didn't heal anything. Just, God just didn't want the noise and do, did something to close your mouth. Praise the Lord. I, I, it's not as if I want to finish this Bible study today. I don't want it to be plenty. I want us to be able to go back and look at ourselves bit by bit. Check yourself. Check your own life. What is going on? Was Jesus making a careless statement? I in them and they in me. I in you and you in me. Was that a careless statement? Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There is no Christianity without yoke and burden, and yoke is not sweet. <laughs> so if you want that Christianity, that's today's description of Christianity. No burden, no yoke. Ah, you are walking on a bed of roses, some kind of nonsense. Go ahead. You will never find Jesus in such a person. And that person can never be in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Galatians 2 verse 20. Galatians 2 20. Your thing has gone on holidays. I have been crucified, I mentioned it already. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Who can say that? I am talking about crucified. There is nothing that is crucified that can come out the way it was. But who can say, I mean, the thing I used to say is, let me sit down and look at my life 10 years ago. What's really the difference? Well, I can preach. Uh, well, I speak in tongues and prophesy. So is that all? Does that put Jesus in me? Because here Paul is saying, when you see me, you are just, it, what you are seeing is a picture. The real person is Christ. It's not me you are seeing, you are seeing Christ. It is the ability to get to that point. That is where we have to head to. Look at things differently now. How do I become that person? That is, that is the person, that is Jesus walking around. Remember the topic? 
walking Jesus. So that when you walk past, I said the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Why? Because of the way they live. They said, these ones are the manifestations of Christ. So when you see them, you have seen Christ. Now, are those the ones that the devil will resist? No, but simple question. If Jesus is in you, can the devil resist you? Now, how many of us has the devil not resisted? In fact, resist is the wrong word. <laughs> How many of us has the devil not overcome from time to time? So that the day you manage to carry your head up, oh, I had victory. What should be a continuous thing has become a celebration for one moment. That same day that you finished testimony in church of how you had victory last night, younger wolf all, let's see what will happen that night. <laughs> <laughs> the devil shows up. He's not only resisting you, he's putting you under a bushel and he will sit on top. You wake up. I don't even know why they want to kill me. If Jesus was in you, would they want to kill Jesus? Because this brings us to a very important point. Why would I pray against what he is doing? Because Jesus is not in me. That is why he's able to do something that I feel is going to destroy me. So I pray against him. If Jesus was in me, would he be able to do anything? Which human being in this world can do anything against Jesus? My uncle, extremely wicked. If he saw Jesus, would he do anything? But he sees you and sees you completely empty. So why wouldn't he do what he's doing? You are supposed not to be a person who talks about the Holy Spirit. You are supposed to be the embodiment of Jesus at all times. At all times. And you see the world of darkness, they very easily recognize where Jesus is. I think those demons, the sons of Sceva, the demons in the two mad men. But can you imagine? That thing I used to say, I still wonder till today. This one madman, he beats up Emmanuel tears his clothes completely. Me, I'm standing on the line on. I am number five. Beulah is number two. He does the same thing. Grace. Miracle. And I'm still standing. And he will finish with me. Gets to number six. Gets to Igba number seven. Bros. But you know what is happening there? It is exactly what we are saying. The devil, they don't have any power against the devil. And that is what happens with us. And don't think that you, as a human being, will ever have power against the devil. You will not. But if the Christ were there, finish. If Jesus was inside you, that devil immediately opens the door and he's gone. Immediately he opens the door. What he sees is Jesus. He's not seeing you again. That your uncle, as wicked as he was, that used to sit on your bed every day, he opens the door and sees Jesus. Will he remember to come to your house again? Or rather than that, we'll spend all the time, Lord, don't let him enter here this night. Lord, you know I need rest. You said you will give me rest. Let me experience that rest tonight. All of that unto God. And do nothing. Unnecessary noise. <laughs> but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live a different kind of life, a life in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, let me see. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, uh. Let's 
second corinthians chapter 13 let me check what verse verse 5 i think so examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? I said I'm not going to take plenty. I'll stop there today. Go back and do self-examination, proper self-examination. This should be me walking as Jesus, but is it true? At this point, nobody needs to tell you, don't do this sin, don't do the other sin. I mean, no, that's irrelevant, completely relevant story. <laughs> it's no use, there's no need to even talk about such things. Examine yourself. But the examination, the, you see the yardstick for the examination, Christ being in me. My, does my life accept him to enter there? Or I can pray until Jesus enters me and I lie. <laughs> he won't enter. Praise the Lord. Who has a question? the Lord. Hallelujah. This teaching uh, is for somebody that has met Jesus. Mm. Now, how did he do the meeting in the first place? How did he do what? How did he meet Jesus to be able to arrive at the steps to now live like Jesus, follow Jesus and all of that? What do you mean? How does anybody meet Jesus? Uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm but asking this, you. This looks like is somebody that has already met Jesus. A fellow has to live every day like Jesus. I have not met Jesus. How do I know how to live like Jesus? Uh, that's like asking uh, <laughs> about, we are talking about how to get a, a bachelor's degree. And you are saying, if I'm not in primary school, how does the primary school concern bachelor's degree? The fellow who has not met Jesus will grow up to it when he eventually meets with Jesus. He even has an advantage because he knows what is in front. But then that fellow also has something to work for. Can I live my life like Jesus? If it is possible, then let me find out how to do it. It is up to that person to come and find out how to become, to meet Jesus. But this Bible study is principally for the people who say they are in Christ. When you claim to be in Christ. The other fellow is not in Christ and finds this kind of thing, so how do I get there? It's the person's right to ask. Any question? So we'll go back and do examination, self-examination. This removes the idea of I went to church so that Jesus would do something for me. I wouldn't need Jesus to do anything for me. That is the truth. By the time that what is walking around is Jesus in me, what would be my problem that I need solution for? Because if it is Jesus walking, he can't have a problem. That is the thing that we have to bear in mind. If it is Jesus walking around, that Jesus cannot have a problem. So if me, I am a transformation of that Jesus walking around, then I won't have to pray concerning a problem. But for so long as that does not happen, I'll have problems to pray about. And that is why most people you find in church 99.999% of the people in church, they are there for God to solve their problems. Now we want to grow from that level onto the level of Jesus so that 
I am no longer in church so that God will solve some problem for me. I don't have any issues with that. I am trying to perfect my association with God. You have a question? Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Apostle, this teaching is very touching. Touching in the sense that uh, there are people here that would love to really identify or be absorbed in Jesus, Jesus in them, them in Jesus to get things done. But is it by practical exercise or by prayer or by mere desire or constantly examining the Bible so that we get it done? How do we, those who are quite desirous, get it done? Jesus said, anyone that desires to come after me will do what? Do what? Take up his cross daily and follow me. That means I have to take the action continually. Not that ah, I did it, that is over. Uh -uh. You have to pick, pick up your cross daily and follow. So it's not a function of prayer or desire. I had already said that this business has, has nothing to do with how long I have prayed. Or how long somebody laid hands on me or some kind of anointing, those ones are out of it. We are talking of looking at my life, what is not right. Like I said, very basic thing. Something happens and Grace has asked me a question. I know what I should tell her so that I'll pass. But the first thing in my heart is, would Jesus say that thing? That has nothing to do with prayer. Now, if Jesus wouldn't say it, should I say it? If I say it, that means he's not in me. He's out. I am not giving him the environment to abide in. I am the one that will make myself an environment that Jesus can live in. That is a practical thing. That does not come by prayer. Thank you. Any question? Yes. Am I the one on my own that we know that, uh, okay, like the Sister Grace example that you just used, Grace said something and I'm supposed to respond. And on my own, I will just know that, ah, the is loss that of, how Jesus... The loss of God, where are they written? Is that how Jesus is going to The loss of God, where are they written? In the heart of men. Okay. So every man on the road. There is no everywhere. human being in this world who does not know right from wrong. Not one. Fine. That means that the issue of uh, taking the first step of coming to Jesus is not is not dealt with in this matter now. Everybody has. You are still going back to what is irrelevant. I said whoever has not met Jesus should ask. So you are going back to what is not relevant. You are saying that the laws of God are written in the heart of men. Every Everybody man. knows that. There is nobody who does not know good from evil. Okay. And I have said from the first moment anybody is done, I mean is born, that fellow displays that knowledge at that spot. Okay. There is nobody who comes into this world and spends one hour that has not displayed the knowledge of good and evil. Nobody. So, so you don't need to, a third party to I'm come and say. I'm just trying to clear something. Clear, go now, ahead. So it means that every day that I live, I should live by that knowledge of good and evil to be able to become Jesus that is walking the, on the road. The way you are going about it is you are making the matter complicated. If I live my life normally unto God, that's all. Things get very easy. This one I know is wrong. I shouldn't do it. Because Jesus wouldn't do it. I say I've stopped the Bible study so far. We'll get to the other side. I says, as he is, so are we in this world. So that thing that I'm doing, is that what he would do? If he wouldn't do it, then I can't do it. I don't want to make the thing complicated. That's why I cut it up there. Next time, we'll follow it up. 
and get to the end. But somebody has to get to that point of walking, and that's Jesus moving. Who gets the benefits? Man. The things that we call prayer topics, somebody will like list, list, list. At the time that Jesus is walking, where is the prayer topic going to? It's not as if this world will be devoid of people who live like that. In fact, that will always be the majority of the world. But those who actually have transformed into Jesus will always be very few. You know what Jesus said? The way to heaven is what? Very narrow. And very few people shall find it. And I've often said that if that statement ended there, it would be wonderful. But nobody said, among those who are found, who are found, many of them will strive to enter. But they will not be able. All of the Christianity of somehow will sit around until they enter heaven. Now lie. <laughs> My burden and my yoke and your cross. They are not talking about some rose garden. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So let's go do self-examination. See what you can change. See how far you can go. Don't tell yourself you wake up tomorrow morning, you have become the expert. Lie. Once you start from that premise, you have already failed. <laughs> I think I said on Sunday, if you want to grow, you grow gradually. But if you are growing from the top, where are you going to? Grave, man. <laughs> so you have to learn to grow step by step, inch by inch. I change this one, change this one. I change and I find that I go back there, I still continue. And God sees you and sees what efforts you are making. God has not allowed, uh, uh, left anybody on his or our own to function. No way. On our own, we can never change. But God sees when your heart is yielded to him, he will help you succeed. That is what is important. That is something you must realize. Don't think that is something that you are doing on your own. On your own, you can never do it. Never. But when God is involved, the things get easy. Praise the Lord. Let's stand up. I want us to pray for ourselves. Father, have mercy on me. Mm. I have arrived at this point. Very importantly, Holy Spirit, show to me everything in my life that I must change. And help me with the realization when the thing has changed.
In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Father thank you. I pray that there shall be soldier hard in us to examine ourselves. I pray that your presence will help us to look inwards. And we'll arrive at the corrections we need for our lives. And in coming into yielding completely to your spirit. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We'll give our offering. It is a great thing to serve the Lord. It is a great thing to serve the Lord. It is a great thing to serve the Lord. Walking in the light of God. Oh, walk, walk, walk. Walking in the light. Oh, walk. Walking in that will yield to you and walk in you in Jesus name Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore Amen.